and Dr. Delgracious Munube, who are going to lead us through the clinical management of sickle cell disease. Uh, but we shall see how we shall we shall go. It will be through responding to your questions today. Uh, so we'll be able to respond to the questions and the concerns that you have. But before that, I will have a few words from uh, uh, this month about the Osaka Health Forum, Benjamin. All right, thank you so much, Prof, uh, for this opportunity. Once again, I welcome members to this weekly CME. Thank you for choosing to be to have your Friday with Buso Gareta Forum. And this is um, one of our projects that we look at uh, continuously developing uh, professionals. And I believe by uh, all medical workers on this call will benefit through uh, this weekly CME that we are having. Yeah, um, about Buso Gareta Forum, uh, this is always what we present, but new members who are here on this forum, uh, Buso Gareta Forum is a government organization. Uh, its offices are in Jinja, and uh, our niche is that we, we bring all partners and stakeholders, and bringing all of them and putting efforts together, I believe we are going to improve health and livelihood of uh, people living in Buso that's our mission. And uh, this mission drives us to our vision, which is a healthy uh, living Wusoga. We want that people in, in this in this region are healthy and thriving. Uh, Wusoga does not go by the boundaries. In person, anywhere is part of Wusoga. So we can serve in person wherever they are. Just like this team is uh, reaching beyond the region. Yeah, our core values, um, just as any other good organization, uh, However, you look at transparency, accountability, teamwork, and integrity. We really value them, and we work uh, to achieve our mission, and we're putting this at our forefront. As an organization, this is the way we, we work to achieve our vision. We work, uh, these are the strategies. Uh, we have health Workforce Capacity Building Initiative, just like one of them being the CMEs. Uh, we also have physical CMEs. Uh, like people, if you're on this call and you're from Namutumba, please, we shall have a CME at Namutumba Health Center 3 on 21st. Please be mobilized and mobilize other people to come and attend at 2 p.m. Um, we also have our uh, work streams. We have technical working groups. Uh, these are led, these are among NCDs. We have a technical working group on uh, non-communicable diseases, sickle cell. We have... Uh, continuous professional development like we are having, we, yeah, among others. And these are, are led by good people whom we believe they can support us. You can be part of a technical working group at also the firm, you can choose to volunteer with us, everything alone. So we're very working with other stakeholders. We're very working with other individuals uh, to achieve our, our vision. Buso Greater Forum is a membership organization. And all the most of the resources that we are running on, please come from the membership subscriptions. This CME is funded by the membership subscription that you give to us. That's why we are requesting that every person on this call, please, you can choose you choose to be a member of Buso Greater Forum. Subscribe to us such that we continue reaching out to more people. Subscription is a hundred thousand for a year for individuals, and if you want to be a lifetime member of Buso Greater Forum, you pay one million shillings, and then your institution can be part of Buso Greater Forum by paying five hundred thousand shillings uh, a year. So please, we kind of request you for us to continue going on with these activities. Subscribe to us and be a member of Buso Greater Forum. Um. Some of our core programs, we have reproductive health, uh, uh, sorry, reproductive maternal newborn and ch child and adolescent health, that's from NAC. Uh, we have malaria, HIV and TB. These are, uh, are, are, are programs that we are having activities that we are running. Nutrition and early child uh, development, regional planning and data use and communicable diseases and urban health. You can contact us at uh, you can contact us on our website. 
and our website is so much resourceful. Please, if you want such CMEs like this one, we are having the presentation will be on our website. Uh, if you want a video, please go through our website. You'll have it, even other content. If you want to know anything about the region, uh, any health center, centers of excellence, please visit our website. You can look at our Twitter for other insights, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube as all the recordings of such sessions. You can learn even after such a session has been completed. This CME specifically has been powered by Maisha Maid. And um, at this point, I'll request Dennis Kato. I'll give you a minute to talk about Maisha Maid, and then we go into the session. Please unmute and talk about Maisha Maid. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm Dennis. I'm working with Maisha Maid. I'm based in Busoga, specifically in Igang. Uh, Maisha Meads is a software company. We develop software for farmers, those solutions for farmers, dagger shop, and clinics. Uh, this software solution can help farmers or any medical facility to manage their stock or to monitor their stock even if they are not allowed. They can be viewing whatever happening at their stock. It is like an eye, you live there at your facility. Uh, to look for you, for you be there somewhere monitoring your business using your smartphone. So this software can be installed on smartphone, computer and tablets and monitor your business from wherever you are. You'll be able to view the sales they have made, the products, information about your products, for example, product expiries, those about to go out of the stock or out of stock. You can even use this system to, more, to, to make orders even if you are not at your facility. It is basically for medical facilities. Yeah, and it is for you to, to get this software, you pay a one-time payment of 150 for drug shop and clinics or 300 for pharmacies. It is a one-time off. You pay once and you enjoy this, the services until the end. Yeah, that is all from us. In case you need this software, you can contact me. I'm going to put my contacts in the chat box. Thank you. Back to you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dennis. I hand over to Professor to take over the session. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, on the program, I saw that uh, there were presentations, but uh, I know Dr. Munube and Dr. Namaza are on, and my understanding is that we are going to respond to to the questions of of, of the people. Uh, Ruth and, and 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 Dr. Dale. Yes, that's true. Okay, so thank you. So there are many questions that came. Uh, we are grateful for the questions. There are many. And uh, I thought that we could group them. They are there actually, there are more than 50 questions and we have uh, about 50 minutes now. So I think that it's better to group them. Uh, there were many questions about hydroxyurea use uh the guidelines that we are using in uganda if there are any alternatives for using hydroxyurea or using a drug that has to be given every day contraindications so i request that we start off by responding uh clarifying on the use of hydroxyurea in sickle cell disease Thank you, Professor. I suggest that uh, Dr. Munube starts and I'll add on. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ruth. Um, I think first things first, the, the one of the questions that had come up was uh, availability of hydroxyurea and also whether the national medical stores provides hydroxyurea. I would say first and foremost, National Medical Stores has hydroxyurea on their essential drug list. 
and it is available. The biggest challenge for most of the health facility is the cost on ordering. So you must be able to have additional resources to order them. Someone had mentioned that there's a health facility with over 200 uh, patients with sickle cell health center for, yes, a health center for can order for hydroxyurea. I think that was Buyinja Health Center 4. I don't know where that is. Uh, Desmond will, will guide us. But yes, it is available. But back to the main questions with regards to hydroxyurea. How do we initiate hydroxyurea? In Uganda, currently, we have a, a, an average dose per kg of hydroxyurea, which is 20 milligrams per kg per day that we initiate hydroxyurea on. But keeping in mind that there is low dose hydroxyurea doses from as low as 10 milligrams per kg all the way to high or maximum tolerated dose, of 35 milligrams per kg. That is how we initiate. And I think uh, Dr. Ruth will talk more about it later. Is hydroxyurea indicated for every person with sickle cell disease? Studies have been shown that all people with sickle cell disease should be initiated on hydroxyurea based on the benefits. And I'll explain more. In our setting, most of the studies that are being done look at from nine months of age and above. So all children who are nine months and above can be initiated on hydroxyurea. Is hydroxyurea available in different packages? I would say yes, but currently we only have the capsule form that is within uh, Uganda. And within a short time, we hope we will have what we call a scored form or a ta tablet form, which can be broken so that we can give lower doses at the right age and at the right weight. Guidelines for hydroxyurea are available with the guidelines of the management of sickle cell disease. And I will hopefully share with Desmond a copy so that we can share to all the me members has a guideline which is approved for use in Uganda. Is there an alternative to hydroxyurea? Yes, there are, there are other drugs that are available. However, they are not on our essential drug list, but they are being known to show additional benefits in terms of reducing pain in children and adult sickle cell disease. For example, we have an oral powder called glutamine, which can be used as a drug modifying agent, which is used for the management of sickle cell disease. It has not been licensed for use in Uganda for the meantime. Then we have voxelato, which is another new drug, which is available for the management of sickle cell disease, and it's mainly used. The indication is for management of pain, and the mode is that it is a hemoglobin oxygen um, attractor. So what, what it does, it's able to absorb the oxygen that is usually lost within the body, and it increases the hemoglobin's affinity to absorb more oxygen. So it's one of the drugs that has been used within the world. I'll stop here briefly and maybe ask Ruth to comment about uh, additional indications for hydroxyurea. Thank you, Dr. Mnube. I think there are no additional indications. If you have a child who has uh, severe pain, more than five episodes in a year. If you have a child who has beta ketosis syndrome, if you have a child who has got stroke, if you have a child who has a low baseline hemoglobin of less than six, please start a child on hydroxyurea. But like Dr. Munobe said, all children or all patients from the age of nine months 
should be initiated on hydroxyurea. It is a standard of care, uh, and I think uh, it should all be comfortable using it. And, and starting it early helps to prevent uh, the occurrence of complications. Okay, so we start it as early as nine months, and it's been found to be safe even in a child as, who's as young as nine months. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Nawazi. And so someone had asked, what, what is the schedule for the hydroxyurea use? So as I mentioned earlier, it is given per kilogram body weight daily. So the amount of hydroxyurea you give will be based on the weight of the patient. However, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a capsule form of 500 milligrams. So we tend to calculate the daily requirement and calculate what we call a weekly dose. And we divide the medication based on the size of the capsule over days in, in a week. And that enables us to, to, to provide the total weekly dose. Someone had asked the role of hydroxyurea in the management of sickle cell disease. And Dr. Namazi had mentioned, one, it helps to reduce painful crisis. Two, it helps to reduce the risk of acute chest syndrome. Three, it helps to build the hemoglobin F so that you are able to reduce the HBS percentage. Four, it can help to reduce the risk of stroke. Five, it can help to reduce the risk of abdominal crisis, priapism, and many other acute and chronic complications of, of sickle cell the disease. In the management of sickle cell patients, uh, it, it is initiated at nine months, and someone is asking why at nine months? Uh, most of the studies have actually only started uh, hydroxyria at, at, at that age, and mainly because of the approvals that were allowed at that time. They were not able to uh, allow children less than than that age. So that would be the main reason why in nine months. However, I know from our experience, some of the children who have very severe forms of sickle cell disease, even as low as six months, have been initiated. But you keep in mind that the manufacturing label and approval is mainly for nine months and above. Uh, Professor Chiguli, I think I've gone over most of the hydroxyurea uh, qu questions within the, the summary sheet. Yes, thank you, Dr. Munube and Dr. Namazi. Uh, so colleagues, let's not fear hydroxyurea. People are saying, is there an alternative to taking a daily medicine? But these children eat every day, they drink every day. I don't see why they cannot take a drug that is going to help them uh, prevent all those complications, live a better life uh, if it's taken every day. And uh, it's not only children, even adults uh, that should be given hydroxyurea. So I, I think we should move on. Uh, and move to something that will not take long. Uh, there were some questions on malaria. What drugs should we use for hemoprophylaxis? And how should we treat? Uh, the question was severe malaria, but I think we can broaden up to, to how do we treat malaria. Then after that, we shall move to another broad area. So I hope that we'll not take a lot of time on the questions on malaria, and then we'll address the others. So over to you, Dale and Ruth. Malaria, chemoprophylaxis, but also treatment for simple and severe malaria. Um, thank you, Professor Chiguli. Uh, with regard to the management of malaria in sickle cell disease, I must um, emphasize that we use the current clinical guidelines for the management of malaria. However, I, I must also say that because children who have sickle cell disease do not often get malaria, but if they get malaria, 
they are at a higher risk of getting a severe form. So we, in our guidelines, especially in Mulago and in many other cell centers, we manage malaria in sickle cell as a severe form. And we start with the management of IV artesonate, depending on the weight. And the weight guidance is 20 kilos so that you are able to give the appropriate dose per kg. And we give at zero, at 12 and 24. And then we change to oral medication, which is atimetha and umefantrin. However, based on current studies, after the completion of your antimalarial treatment, we do also put the children on long-term chemo prevention using uh, docotexin or DRTEP or DHA and PPQ, dihydroartesimate and piperaquine. And that enables the reduction of the risk of malaria in the next three months following that infection. There is also the issue of managing the anemia. If this child has a uh, a rapid drop in their steady state of hemoglobin of more than two grams per deciliter, or they have clinical evidence of hemolysis in terms of hemoglobinuria where they are passing tea-colored or bloody urine, we tend to transfuse. Sometimes they also present with organomegaly, in particular, an increasing size of their splints, and we will also consider a blood transfusion if it's pack cells, it's at 10 milligrams per kg. If it's whole blood, at 20 mils per kg. With regards to other malaria uh, chemo prevention, we use mainly in the central region, we use fancy dao SP on a monthly dose. In other regions um, in the east and east central, they tend to use a lot of chlor chloroquine on a weekly dose. So those are our two main uh, malaria prevention strategies. There are some people who react to uh, our common drugs. So we also have mefloquine, which can be used, and that is given every two weeks. Um, over to you, Dr. Namazi, for any additional comments. Thank you, Dr. Mnove. Uh, like you have said, even if the risk of malaria is lower, when children with sickle cell disease and adults with sickle cell disease get malaria, they get the severe forms. So we recommend that you admit all persons with sickle cell disease with malaria because they can quickly get into severe anemia and die. And then we still recommend that you give them prophylaxis and um, you can use Fancida or chloroquine and the other antimalarials that other people use like Proguanil. And there's a big clinical trial that has just been concluded uh, suggesting that I think uh, DP may actually be better. We shall wait for the results. So please give them malaria prophylaxis, but also use other malaria prevention strategies like sleeping under mosquito, uh, mosquito net, uh, closing windows early, just like any other, and any other, any other child. Malaria and sickle cell disease is a killer. And it also causes, triggers a lot of sickle related complications like pain and stroke. So the prevention of malaria and sickle cell disease is very, very important. Thank you. Okay, thank um, you very much. Um, Professor Chiguli, there was something that we missed to just explain. I want to explain it quickly and we move on. There was something to do with uh, why the malaria, uh, there's, a, there's a lower risk of malaria. So most times, uh, the red blood cells, because of the change from the donut shape to the sickle cell, don't allow the effective carrying of oxygen. And this reduces the multiplication of the malaria parasites. And also it reduces the entry of the malaria parasite into the red blood cell, thereby protecting them from malaria. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And probably that is why the sickle gene survives in malaria endemic areas. Uh, there are more questions about the, the, the specific drugs and more, and I'll request that uh, this information is, is, is there. 
the doses for the drugs we can we can we can read about them uh, and best use the the malaria guidelines uh, when it uh, for severe malaria as we've been advised and the prophylaxis which we have in our guidelines and don't forget the insecticide treated mosquito nets uh, because if you say mosquito nets the mothers might buy the most beautiful or the people might buy the most beautiful nets which are not treated. Uh, so, and, and let's use the drugs that are available. So I want us to move from malaria. Uh, there was a number of questions on acute chest syndrome. Uh, I want us to move to acute chest. Uh, what it is and and uh, how do you make a diagnosis and, and the management. Uh, and then we'll see how to move. I see some questions in the chat. We shall do them. Uh, if time allows, there were a number of questions that were sent before this session. That's what we are doing. Uh, and I'll welcome any People who want to have additional questions, please put up your hands uh, if you still need more clarifications as we move so that we all move together. Okay, thank so, you, Pro Professor. So uh, acute chest syndrome is a clinical entity which is characterized by chest pain, fast breathing or difficulty in breathing, sometimes with or without a fever, but also associated with the reduction of the level of the oxygen saturation and a new infiltrate on a chest X-ray. Now, in our setting, we tend not to have what we call steady state chest X-rays or baseline chest X-rays. So it's normally hard for us to describe this new in infiltrate. However, we're able to make a clinical diagnosis. There's also a caution here that sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish with, between acute chest syndrome and a severe pneumonia. So you have to be able to assess the child or the, the adult quite effectively with your clinical skills and your knowledge. In addition to that, there could be some risk factors there could be a prior history of a fever. There could be a prior history of a painful crisis in any other part of the body. There could be a prior history of a surgical operation or any form of exposure to any form of anesthesia. Most times it is general an anesthesia. With regard to, to treatment, first thing you would want to manage the pain by effective fluid management. And our fluid management requires you to give 75% uh, of the minimum requirements for this child, provide the child with um, pain medication according to the WHO guide or the WHO ladder, and also initiate the child on a broad spectrum antibiotic, which covers both gram positive and gram negative organisms and also a macrolide, which covers atypical bacteria in this child. These are the, the main principles for managing sickle cell disease. But in most cases, all children will be provided with oxygen at the onset, once you suspect acute chest syndrome, and you will have a baseline uh, hemoglobin so that you're able to monitor the Hb level but with acute chest syndrome, this is one of the indications for a blood transfusion in sickle cell disease. Um, over to you, Ruth, for any additions. Thank you, Dr. Munobe. So uh, like Dr. Munobe has said, acute chest is one of the common complications of sickle cell disease that we are seeing. It is also associated with an increased risk of death. Among the deaths that we're seeing on the wards, it's uh, a leading cause. And so it's important for you to recognize and treat it early. 
any form of pneumonia in a child with sickle cell disease have a high index of, of suspicion for acute chest syndrome. It's almost impossible to distinguish acute chest syndrome and pneumonia. So children and adults who have signs and symptoms of pneumonia, please go ahead and treat as acute chest syndrome. Uh, it's an, an uh, early initiation of uh, oxygen, blood transfusion helps you to reduce on the risk of uh, progression to severe disease. Uh, there's something that we call incentive spirometry for children with acute chest syndrome. It's basically really opening up the lungs and allowing uh, uh, air to uh, easy ventilation. If you don't have a spirometer, we of, often don't have spirometers, just tell the patient to blow a balloon. When someone blows a balloon, they maximally exhale and inhale, and that way opens up the lungs. So for all patients with acute chest syndrome, whenever they are awake, encourage them to do incentive spirometry. Early ambulation, so keep the patient out of uh, the bed, tell them to move around. Even if they're on oxygen, they can move around their bed. It also helps to uh, improve uh, outcomes for acute chest syndrome. Antibiotics are very important because uh, almost 30% of cases are because of an infectious cause. The other causes are fat embolism uh, that, that causes uh, uh, occlusion of, of the pulmonary vessels. But in our setting, infections are very important. And it's important that you cover the most common causes, uh, which are encapsulated organisms, but also atypical organisms. So give a broad spectrum antibiotic but also give a macrolide if there is no change. And what are you looking out for? So you need to do proper monitoring of the patient. We're looking out for oxygen needs. If the patient continues to need more and more oxygen, that's a flag that you're not, uh, this, child, this patient might be needing more uh, ventilation. If uh, the pain is not reducing, if uh, they're changing signs, for example, if today, it's just that one lung having palpitation, then tomorrow it's both lung, that means that acute chest is actually progressing. So it's important for you to monitor this patient. It's almost uh, what you'd call acute respiratory distress syndrome in sickle cell disease. So it's important that you actually monitor. There are two forms of acute chest syndrome that we see. There is a mild form, which is treated as pneumonia. You give antibiotics and fluids and then they, they get better. But there's what we call a rapidly progressive acute chest syndrome, which is a killer. You know, within one day, you find the child needs a sip up, then ventilation. So this is important for you to know this very quickly, and then you can change uh, oxygen modalities. Please change antibiotics if within 48 hours you don't see any changes in, 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 a, in a temperature. Please uh, change antibiotics as per protocol. Do your blood cultures to guide you. Sometimes you don't do anything but please don't wait for another 48 hours to change antibiotics if the antibiotics you're giving are not working. Acute, uh, hydroxyurea is known to reduce the incidence of acute chest syndrome, so initiate it early. But if your patient is not on hydroxyurea, once they get an episode of acute chest syndrome, please start hydroxyurea. And this is one of the conditions where we want you to escalate. Dr. Mnumi talked about low dose and fixed dose and then high dose, which we call the maximum treated dose. So these are the kind of patients that you want to be at the maximum treated dose of hydroxyurea. Because uh, a child who has had acute chest syndrome, that very high risk of stroke within six months, that very high risk of another episode of acute chest syndrome, but also long-term, they're at high risk of chronic lung disease. So it's important that uh, we manage them uh, very adequately. So manage the acute episode, but also give secondary prevention, give uh, hydroxyurea to prevent another episode. If the hydroxyurea is not working, these are some, there are some patients where hydroxyurea doesn't work very well, you might combine uh, giving chronic blood transfusion to try to mitigate the risk of acute chest syndrome. Thank you very much. Okay, you thank you, Dr. Namazi. Comment about fluids, maintenance fluids or the need of fluids in management of acute chest syndrome, because it's a question in the chat. Someone is asking, do you need to give, is it 75% of the maintenance fluids? So proper explanation on fluid management in acute okay. chest. So thank you. So the use of fluids in sickle cell disease is, is varies according to the indication. And the, mode of uh, 
delivery can be oral or intravenous. So not of all children and adults with sickle cell disease need IV fluids. But in acute chest syndrome, we give 75% of the maintenance. So you calculate how much fluid that person will, will need. And you know there's formula for doing that. But you get 75% of that. Why? Because already you have lung damage in acute chest syndrome. But also children with acute chest syndrome and also sickle cell disease tend to have a form of a cardiac dysfunction. So if you over fluid overload them, they'll get into pulmonary edema and this, this will actually worsen the acute chest syndrome. So that is why it is recommended that you multiply it by 75%. In other conditions, uh, such as a mild or moderate pain crisis, you can give maintenance. In a severe painful crisis, you can, give, you can multiply the maintenance by 1.5. So the amount of fluid that you give changes according to what indication you're giving the fluids. But also, I want to comment that if a child, and now I'm not talking, about, not talking about only acute case, if a child comes in with pain and they can take orally, you know, if a child, pain is mild or moderate and they can take orally, you can actually give them to take orally. Not all children and adults who come to your hospital need to get IV fluids. Thank you. Thank you. The additional questions, but colleagues, I would advise people with additional questions to, to, to still let this be the incentive for you go to read more about it, talk to Dr. Namaz, Dr. Munube, or anyone about it, uh, so that we develop a habit of, of, of learning continuously. Whatever questions remain, we try to get the answer, we try to get the expert, we try to get the book, because there's a lot of information that we need to, to get. Uh, I want us to move uh, before, I think we shall end with gene therapy and bone marrow transplantation. These are two questions that are coming in. Uh, but before we reach that, I want us to talk about pain, pain management. How do we manage uh, patients who come in with pain? Uh, do you, we need to use pethidine at all? Do we, how do we use the, 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 the pain management drugs? And what else do we do? Uh, so to, let's talk about pain. Then we'll support blood transfusion and end with uh, the gene therapy and bone marrow transfusion. And yeah, there's um, a hand. Uh, please, um, Vincent. Go ahead. Ask your question quickly. Sorry, I joined a bit late, uh, but uh, I was asking, I have uh, colleagues who are being uh, uh, told that there is some medicine under research from Japan in a clinic somewhere, I think in Kavalagala, and uh, that uh, it has some potential to 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 almost to heal the, the way the other one described it, that it makes the gene dormant are you aware <laughs> of any research or something like that okay you'll get your answer but you know we know that genes will not be dormant and we know that the proven medicine that have been talked about uh, is hydroxyurea it's available, at least it's available. Uh, but yes, Dr. Munube, can we go to pain management? Yes, um, so thank you, Professor. So the first thing that is important for us to know in sickle cell disease, we have two distinct types of pain. We have first the acute pain, and then second, we have the, the, the chronic pain. Now it's very important for us to be able to distinguish because some of our patients with sickle cell disease always have a certain amount of pain which they, they manage and live with. However, when they get excruciating pain that brings them to the hospital, you need to consider that the underlying cause is an acute vaso occlusion. Now this acute vaso occlusion can be as a result of many things. We have talked about infections, we have talked about dehydration, we have talked about low hemoglobin levels. 
but as you think of pain, you need to think of the pain in four ways. One, pain that occurs as a result of inflammation, ischemia or tissue injury, pain as a result of nervous system sensitization, three, pain as a result of stress, and four, pain as a result of psychosocial disturbances in this child or, or adult. Now, when you look specifically at acute pain, what do we need? We need to intervene immediately. And we recently had an experience of someone living with sickle cell disease where she said, when I come in with pain, most of the health workers start by taking a long history about my painful event. We are supposed to intervene within the first hour. That is what is called the standard of care. What do we do? We start with rehydration. It can be oral, it can be IV. And why am I stating? Because sometimes we tend to want to force someone who can drink to go onto an IV line when they can actually drink. So it can be oral, it can be IV. How much fluid do you give? If it's oral, you, they can drink as much as they can. If it's IV, we tend to give based on the per kilo body weight of this child. For the first 10 kilos, we give a total of 100 mils per, per kg. For the next 10, it is at 50 mils per kg. And every other additional one kilo, you give at 20 mils per kg. So if you have a child who is 10 kilos, you give a total of one liter. If you have a child who is 15 kilos, you give 10 times 100, which is one liter, plus 50 times five, which is 250. So you give a total of 1,250 mils over a period of one to two hours to rehydrate this child. That is the first thing you do. Then you think of the level of pain and what you need to give in terms of analgesics. You can give oral NSAIDs, which can be ibuprofen. You can give oral opioids for mild to moderate pain, depending on the severity. And you can give intravenous opioids if the child has severe pain. So these are the basic guidelines that we need when it comes to management of uh, pain. Um, over to you, Dr. Namazi, for any additions. Thank you, Dr. Mnube. Um, it's important, if you can, to use a pain score, which will help you to, under, to know what medication you're going to use. If, if it is mild pain, you can use an NSAID and paracetamol. If it is moderate, you can go to an opioid and like and that. And also it helps you to help you to uh, step down. If the child is improving, you can step down from uh, morphine at a dose at a higher dose to a low dose morphine. So if you can, please use a pain score for the management of pain. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rose. Okay. And I, sorry, Pro, Pro, Professor, I forgot to answer the issue of pethidine. Uh -huh. So, pethidine, and, and I quickly want to say, pethidine is not indicated for the management of acute or chronic pain in people living with sickle cell disease, whether children or adults, because of one major reason, and that is as a result of addiction. So, please, members, pethidine should not be on your prescription list for the management okay. of pain. So we have the, you call them opioids, uh, and we have morphine, okay? Is that right, Dr. Munube? We have non-opioids, which are our NSAIDs uh -huh. and paracetamol, and we have our opioids, which are morphine. And that okay. is the, the main uh, opioid that we use in Uganda. Okay, thank you. And please, if there's any underlying 
caused for this uh, uh, vas occlusion, look for it and, and manage it appropriately. Sometimes there's an infection. Uh, the time is running very fast. How do we treat a mesentery crisis? Isn't it one of the crises that you've described quickly because someone is wants to to know in, in one minute and then we'll move on. How do you treat a mesentery crisis? So, so thank you. So a mesentery crisis, just like most of our other crises, is as a result of vaso occlusion. So our mesentery, if we all remember our anatomy, is our policeman of the abdomen, and it has very good vasculature. So as a result of the occlusion, there is actually inability of this of the movement of our small gut and our long gut. And as a result of that, there is distension in the abdomen and then accumulation of, of gas. So when these children come to you, they have a distended abdomen, which can actually be tense. If you are not aware this child has sick, sickle cell disease and you're a medical officer in a health facility and has not seen a case like this, this child can easily end up in theater as an intestinal obstruction. So we oh. have to be so we have to be cautious. How do we manage? One, we rest the gut. Two, we give IV fluids based on what I described earlier. Okay, Three, fluid. We mean by rest the gut. Rest the gut means that nil papa os. It means that we are not going to encourage feeding of this child because mm -hmm. we want to to treat the underlying cause because there will be no peristalsis when they have an acute acute mesenteric crisis. Okay. Three, we also encourage that this child has a clear history of any prior use of opioids because they can end up with constipation and that is actually the trigger of the mesentery crisis. And if you do a plain abdominal x-ray, you will find the lower gut is full of stool. And in this case, the management is an enema to clear out all the stool and magically you see that abdomen just drop down to it, its normal size. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ruth, do you want to add anything? No, no, I, I don't okay. think so. Thank you. Thank you, mesentery crisis. I think we are sorted. And please, these synopses should lead us to to read more read widely understand for ourselves uh, because uh, we need to read for ourselves in order to understand and apply that knowledge i want us to go to to the question how do you advise a patient who needs hip replacement where should they go is it free uh, who has uh, vascular necrosis of the of the hip joint. Um, so thank you, Professor. A vascular necrosis of, of the hip joint is becoming one of the common complications we are seeing, and this is a chronic complication. As a result of our people living with sick, sickle cell disease growing through the lifespan. So as they increase their mobility, there is increased damage of the joints and it's mainly the weight bearing joints and usually the hip. Hip replacements are done in adults who don't have any evidence of, of any epiphysis growth, which means that the bone is not growing and it requires a surgical intervention, which is a hip replacement, which can be done by an orthopedic surgeon. And the current average cost is about 15 to 25 million per hip. So it is not something that everyone can access. Okay. Is there nowhere where they can get, do it free? 
cheaper. Free, uh, free, free is not a, a good statement because <laughs> okay. the, the, the orthopedic surgeon will do the operation for you for free, but, but the, the requirements, hip. the hip, the hip head, which needs to be put into as a replacement has to be bought. So okay. I think we, we have to be clear on that. Our orthopedic surgeons in very many regional referral centers can actually do this operation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want us to move uh, to quickly answer the question of the gene therapy and bone marrow transfusion. Is it something that we should look out for? Uh, when is it indicated? Very briefly. And I hope that we'll have some time to talk about the blood transfusion, which also had a number of questions. I've not talked about the penicillin prophylaxis or prophylaxis against infection. So those are the three areas. So quickly, those four areas, gene therapy, bone marrow transfusion, uh, prophylaxis against infection, how do we do it? Blood transfusion. Is it true that when you start a transfusion, it means that this child will go on having more and more? Is this something that we should fear in sickle cell disease? Uh, I think those are the three uh, questions that we should address. Um, so thank you. So quickly on bone marrow transplant, indications for bone marrow transplant, Number one is a child with a stroke. That is a 100% indication. A person with sickle cell disease who gets a stroke in any high income country will be the first person to be transplanted. Other indications for bone marrow transplant may be recurrent chronic pain. Three, it may be a child with recurrent acute chest syndrome with multiple ad admissions. And other indications for bone marrow transplant tend to be more social and economical. However, I must state that even in high income countries where bone marrow transplants are available, they are not readily taken up. Thank okay. you. Then gene therapy, quickly. So gene therapy is one of the new modalities that is available in a very, very few centers. I must also state that in Africa, there's a gene therapy trial, which is ongoing, looking at the CRISPR-Cas9 gene, which edits the mutation between the glutamine to valine. And it is a simple, what we call transfusion, where this gene is incorporated into the body and reverses that mutation. And the children are cure of sickle cell disease. It's a very, very, very expensive therapy. And there is one center that in Uganda that is beginning the trial in Luboa. And this is the JCRC center. So we still have a, a, a long way to go because it's just a phase one trial. Thank you. Okay, I hope many of you will live to see that uh, because gene therapy may not only be for sickle cell disease, but for other chronic illnesses. And you know, you just live long for the next 20 years. You may see that. Uh, so chemoprophylaxis against infection, Dr. Namazi, uh, the last few minutes. So um, children and adults, actually mainly children with sickle cell disease at increased risk of getting infections, especially um, bacterial infections against encapsulated organisms because of uh, they lose their splenic function early. So we give uh, chemoprevention to reduce when that risk. 
So from the age, from uh, as soon as you diagnose a child with sickle cell disease, and that's why I want you to diagnose them early, start uh, penicillin prophylaxis. Uh, if a child is less than three years, 125 milligrams of Penv twice a day. And if they're above uh, three years and, and between three and five, 250 milligrams twice a day. At the age of five, the studies showed that there was no benefit uh, of giving chemo prophylaxis against pneumococcus. In our setting, this may not necessarily be true because we are seeing most children coming after five, but that's a, a, a matter of another day. Also give uh, penicillin uh, pneumococcal vaccine, okay? So in addition to the, uh, the UNEPI schedule uh, of uh, PCV at uh, I think six, uh, 10 and 14, for children with sickle cell disease, we give them a booster at the age of two years, another one at the age of five years when we're going to stop penicillin prophylaxis. Some centers practice uh, every five years after that, uh, you boost patients with sickle cell disease with another, with another penicillin uh, anti-pneumococcal vaccine. So that is a chemo prevention for infections for children and adults with sickle cell disease. Okay, thank you very much. Is it true that when you start a blood transfusion, it means that this child will get others? Is that a myth? That's a myth. I think it depends <laughs> on the cause of the anemia in okay. children with sickle cell disease. So for some children, they might get what we call a blood transfusion reactions or they form antibodies, which might continue to break the blood. And so they may tend to get more blood transfusion, but some, for many children, they don't need additional blood transfusion. That being said, there are indications for blood transfusion in sickle cell disease. Not every child with sickle cell disease needs to be transfused. We have talked about acute chest syndrome. We have talked about a drop of uh, hemoglobin of more than two. We have talked about acute stroke and then acute splenic uh, sequestration. So things like uncomplicated uh, painful crises, mesenteric crisis, you know, don't have to give a uh, blood transfusion, periapism. So not everything, uh, like not every condition in the, uh, requires blood transfusion. Because children with sickle cell disease tend to get many transfusions, they also tend to get many complications of blood transfusions. They form antibodies and this can be very problematic because they cause a hemolysis and you, you almost never get a compatible unit. So it's a myth that just because you've received one blood transfusion, you're going to end up getting a, plant, a transfusion forever. So okay. what's the target hemoglobin level? So again, it depends. Children, sickle cell disease is a very interesting disease. Whereas it's a same mutation, everyone, it affects everyone differently. So the target is usually their baseline, okay? okay? So depending on their baseline, you really want to always target their baseline. So if the baseline is seven, you always want to target the baseline. If a child has acute stroke, we target a hemoglobin of nine to 10, okay? So depending on that, so that's why you should have an indication for blood transfusion because your targets are different depending on why you're transfusing. But you usually want to always get back to the child's baseline. Okay, so it's nine, there are many questions. There's sickle cell in pregnancy, the questions, there's the psychosocial uh, issues, psychotherapy, which we've not talked about. So there are very many questions, but today we have try to, to talk about the interventions that will help improve the quality of life in these children with sickle cell disease. Of course, screening should be done early enough. So newborn screening is something that we should all advocate for so that you identify the children early enough and start the interventions. Chemoprophylaxis for antimalarials and also for uh, the infections, the pneumococcal and all those encapsulated organisms. We've talked about it. The hydroxyurea use, we've talked about it. Uh, and other issues that we've talked about today. I think we will not be able to finish, uh, but I just encourage you to read more, discuss more. I believe that we'll come back sometime to talk more about sickle cell disease. Before I hand over to Dr. Waiswa for the, Professor Waiswa for the closing remarks, I should say that on the 13th 
was it yesterday or the other day, there was a, a Lancet Commission report on management of sickle cell disease, assessing the situation and how to move forward. And education is one of the things that is key for us health workers at all levels. We've not talked about prevention, which is key because we need really to target preventive measures. Uh, but I think we cannot do everything in one hour. So I'd like to thank Dr. Munube, Dr. Namazi, and all of you. We are maintaining the questions. I'll now ask uh, Professor Waiswa to give closing remarks for us. Is Prof on? Uh, Dr. Kaweru will stand in for Prof. Okay, Dr. Kaweru, please. Uh, so ten. Uh, so for the people, please contact Dr. Namazi and Deo directly if you have other questions. Dr. Kabweru. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Shiguli and uh, Dr. Deo Gracias and Dr. Namazi for that excellent uh, Dr. presentation. Dr. Kabweru, before, can I say something advising uh, someone with sickle cell disease or career to have children? We should advise reproductive health we should not prevent these people from fulfilling their reproductive health uh, rights if they want to, but they will need uh, more, more advice, which we cannot do today. Dr. Kabweru, sorry for that. Oh, thank you very much, my mentor. And <laughs> thank you for educating the masses. We always are delighted to see you and very humbled and uh, we take this opportunity as Soka Health Forum for is giving us time to come and talk to your country, the ladies and the gentlemen of this nation. And we always are uh, willing to, to see you again and again because you, you have never given up mentoring us. And uh, you make us more brighter so that we can always continue to serve you. So, Professor, we take this opportunity to thank you very much. Uh, for moderating this session. And also we take the opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Munube for that uh, good presentation. And uh, Dr. Namazi on behalf of Soga Health Forum, we thank you and give you this certificate of appreciation. We really thank you very much for enlightening us. And uh, Dr. Munube, last week you really did it. And as they say, you have again done it today, and we shall say you do it again. So thank you very much, Dr. Deo Gracious Munube, for that enlightening uh, talk that actually has made us brighter, and we are ready to continue serving. And Professor Chiguli, what can, what can I say? Uh, apart from saying thank you and thank you and thank you for always being there for us, and may God you bless you and give me give you more years, so that you can mentor the nation and the, the others to come. May God bless you all and a good weekend for God and my country. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night and a blessed weekend.